Right, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the first authority meeting of 2023. Um, feels like uh, Christmas break was a very long time ago now. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, firstly, I'm extremely sorry uh, for anybody who's dialed in online. Um, there's a problem with the cameras, so you will, you probably can't see me or Peter or anybody at my end of the table who's speaking, you'll see people down the other end of the table who are speaking. So you will be able to hear everybody. Uh, so I do apologise and uh, hope that this is just temporary for this meeting to be fixed by the next meeting. Uh, also, uh, for authority members and anybody who's in the room, uh, having spent quite a lot of time getting you used to pressing these buttons, uh, the, this, this sort of mic, please don't touch it because it's now on all the time in a, because we're recording. Now you have to touch these buttons on the bigger box uh, and there's a little person there and when you want to speak, just press the little person and then turn it off. Um, anyway, I'm sure we... With, Everybody in the room, we can get used to that. So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, we have apologies uh, from Francis Ashcroft and from Alison McTavish. Uh, oh, and uh, sorry, and Catherine Seddon. Uh, we just note um, that Catherine suffered a, a bereavement. Her mother died and we sent her um, uh, uh, our deepest sympathy. Um, and now, um, declarations of interest, please. I think, Tim? Um, Tim Charles, PR of the Licence Clinic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Jason? Jason Catsbury, PR of the Licence Clinic. Lovely, and Gita. Gita Nagund, licence holder in licence court and diplomats. Lovely, thank you. Uh, we are uh, sorry to hear that our colleague from the DHSC, uh, Steve Pugh, is uh, ill and um, uh, unable to be with us, but we welcome Amy. Thank you. Um, and as always, I mentioned before that we're recording and um, the recording will be placed on the HFEA website. Uh, and I think we all ha also have uh, some observers uh, back online. So you're all very welcome. Um, first item agenda is minutes of the last meeting, which was the 16th of November and matters arising. Any comments on the minutes before we move forward? Uh, Zainab. Just a very tiny thing, but on page 9, 8.6, it should be Donor Conception Network. Thank you. We'll make a note of that. Any other comments? Okay. Um, matters arising. Um, these are set out in uh, tab two. Um, I think almost, when I looked at them, I think almost everything um, is either being dealt with during the in the body of the meeting or is sort of in training. Peter, is there anything you particularly want to raise or not? Uh, so coming on to item three, which is the chair and the chief executive's report. Um, uh, from uh, I'll just give you a brief update of what I've been doing and then hand over to Peter. As you will have seen, um, I've uh, been visiting um, quite a number of clinics and I, I had a, a particularly interesting visit up in uh, Newcastle at the Centre of Life where I, I visited the team carrying out mitochondrial uh, donation and also spoke at, at various events. 
um, Fertility 2023, which was in Belfast. Um, I went to, and uh, Rachel Cutting and, uh, and I were there, um, along with various colleagues uh, uh, of the authority. And we actually, we met lots of, uh, we met lots of people. We met uh, people from, uh, representatives of clinics, both large, uh, you know, multi-site clinics and also small one-site clinics, members uh, from our key stakeholders, from um, the, the uh, various professional bodies who we dealt with. And I think it was very useful. Uh, uh, I think what came out of it, which I was very pleased about, is that there was a general feeling that um, clinics are well supported uh, by the authority um, and that, f for example, following the pandemic, the new inspection, hybrid inspection, inspection regime. Uh, oh, is that uh, an issue? Uh, sorry, there's a bit of background noise here. Well, I'll, I'll continue loudly. Uh, inspection regime, uh, whereby uh, the, the, the there is a paper-based, desk-based. Uh, a desk-based inspection to get the paperwork out the way before the the uh, physical visit to the clinic was very um, well th well thought of, uh, and people liked the idea. Um, and um, also, uh, that there was a lot of support uh, for our forthcoming you know, consultation and the work on the legislative reform. So it was it was it was very useful. Um, I don't know if anybody else who was there, Jason, Tim, or anyone who wishes to say anything about it, but... Oh. The other one. The other oh, one. It's the other one, right. Um, no, I, I would have said you summed it up very well. I wouldn't have anything to add. Great. Um, the only other thing is that, uh, as and we, we, we talk about this, we are, uh, as you know, launching the consultation on legislative reform uh, at the end of February. And one of the things um, that Peter and I will be doing will be will be visiting um, those clinics who perhaps. Um, and not so well known or whose voices aren't quite so loud to make sure that they understand that for them to engage in the consultation is also very important for us and we want to hear their voice as well uh, and we're, we'll get around as, as many of those as possible and I will continue during this year uh, to make as many clinic visits as I can because I think it's sort of uh, a, a, a useful a useful thing to do. Um, so that's really it for me. I'm going to pass over now to Peter.
Thank you, Julia. Um, so as members can see, we in the Licence Committee have kicked off 2023 with a hefty agenda for our first meeting. Um, the minutes for that are still being finalised, so I won't go into details, other than to say that as well as considering um, centres that have a long or significant compliance history, the Licence Committee does also consider applications for research uh, licenses and one of those was in our January agenda um, and a, a really that's always a really interesting aspect of our work on the license committee um, in this particular case it was a, a, an application involving an advanced imaging technique so very different from the bulk of our work but just something I thought I'd draw to other members attention Yes, you've got the uh, details of the meetings uh, on uh, in the papers, uh, and you'll see we've also conducted our annual review of effectiveness, which Paula helped take us through and uh, was very useful. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, add something more to, to give a flavour of the uh, committee meetings, uh, as we've been asked to before. Um, we, we get huge help from two expert advisors uh, to the committee, both one who is advising us from the uh, medical point of view and a, a legal expert. Uh, and just to give you an example of their, their, their usefulness, in the last meeting we had a particular case about the import of gametes, which raised some issues around religious belief, and the lawyer had to direct us to pay particular attention to the uh, protection for religious belief in human rights law. And then there was also an application for PGT for a particular condition, and we were asked to consider a wide range of similar kinds of conditions. Um, but great care had to be uh, taken to uh, separate out which could be properly licensed under our, uh, under our legislative direction. And uh, again, the, uh, the medical expert, along with the experts on the committee, were able to consider that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, in Catherine's absence, Alex Caffetz is going to update on Audit and Governance Committee. Thanks, Julia. So the committee met uh, just before Christmas. We uh, Details are in the papers. We agreed the uh, approach to risk appetite following the stare from authority members at the last authority me uh, meeting. We reviewed the new strategic risk register. I think thanks to Shabir for putting that all together. And we, we, I think we closed one risk and we, we tightened up the wording on, on, on a few on a few others. We had our biannual HR update, including uh, some, some excellent staff survey uh, results. Um, some updates on PRISM, uh, which I think is going well, and also various uh, it, further investments in IT and cyber, including commitment for um, some simulated phishing uh, in the future, which I think is quite important as inbound inquiries will increase as the, as the registers opened up. We also completed an effectiveness review. Uh, and then in the papers after the formal meeting, thanks to KPMG colleagues, we had some further training on how to how to decipher financial reporting and what the committee should be doing. And a, actually a case study on um, where the audit committee hadn't discharged their duties at an NHS trust. So so that was that was that was actually excellent. And thanks to KPMG who, who executed that for us. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, and that, 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 those are the committee reports. SCAC uh, has not met uh, since the last meeting. Uh, and just uh, before I finish, I would just like to say that um, sitting on committees is quite a big part of what authority members have to do, uh, and it's often unsung. It's a lot of work, far more than just uh, coming to authority meetings, and um, I think we must thank all, all the authority members uh, for, for their participation in these really important committees. I do know it's a lot of work, and we really do appreciate it. So now we come on to tab five, which is the performance report. As members know, we consider a performance report at each meeting and invite directors um, to, to highlight issues. So we'll have Peter followed by Claire, Rachel and Richard on various issues. So starting uh, with Peter, who will cover the, uh, as you see, you'll see a, a bit of red in there. One is the, uh, is the increase in sickness, so uh, to discuss that, and also to talk about progress uh, on PRISM. Thanks, Julia. Um, yes, so H HR, you'll know for uh, really quite a number of authority meetings I've raised a concern about turnover. 
Um, while Turner is still above target, it is gradually coming down. Um, so that's clearly a, a good thing, although given the size of the organisation and the way numbers work, it can very easily, with a small additional number of uh, um, resignations, you know, turn up again. But generally the trend on turnover is down, albeit slower than we would wish. Um, sickness, on the other hand, we have for a long time reported lower than public sector average sicknesses. That's recently gone up. Um, I think in part that's kind of winter coughs and colds, but it's also uh, about a couple of people on long-term sick and the possibility, as the notes in the commentary suggest, of a third. And again, given our small size, um, these sorts of indicators are quite, um, you know, that they, they can react quite strongly just to quite small movements. Uh, but my general view is that... Uh, you know, on both of those HR measures, um, given the sort of pressures of winter and a lot of other features about public sector pay and the like, um, the HR position is better than it might have been, uh, if I can put it that way. But very happy to take any questions on that. On PRISM, uh, Alex reported that we had, a, as usual, a full discussion at AGC. So where we are on PRISM is you'll know that the system is up and running and is very efficiently now... Uh, taking data in. Uh, as it said in the management summary, we're well over 300,000 units of data at the moment uh, from all bar um, three clinics, whereas the particular issue is they switched to a new third-party supplier. Um, and so the delays there are with the third-party supplier. But 102 clinics are submitting data and submitting it well, generally at much better uh, levels of error or lower error rates than under, under the old system. Um, so most of our effort now is turning to, if you like, the consequentials from that because, as I've said before, having now established uh, you know, the new data entry system and the new register, we need to build the tools that allows us to extract the data from that. Uh, crucially, that relates to opening the register and choose a fertility clinic uh, and planning work is well uh, ahead, uh, ahead on that. Um, later on, you've got a presentation on the work we've got underway on OTR. Um, but as it says in the performance report, um, we have uh, you know, we are now looking at effectively being in a position of around about July this year, where all the tools we need in order to uh, extract data out of the register for the purposes of OTR performance uh, should be in place. Um, if all of that works as planned, that should greatly increase our ability to do that efficiently and effectively. Um, we can do it at the moment, it's just that it's, it's, it's slow and bureaucratic. And crucially, um, given the in late uh, of this year, we expect, you know, with the lifting of anonymity, uh, OTR applications to increase, uh, at least at a sort of system admin level, uh, we feel that we ought to, by the summer, have the tools uh, to be able to start to, pro to to deal with those increased number of applications. Um, and if they're all done by July, that also gives us a bit of a buffer for the team that operate OTR to actually get used to working the system. Um, so uh, we, we seem to be on track for that, so that's clearly good news. The other thing we're doing is... Uh, having got all the data in, all the historic data in, we are now starting uh, their sort of clean-up process. This is a precursor to running updating Choose a Fertility Clinic. We've got three tranches of sort of data errors, the first of which was released to clinics uh, a bit before Christmas. I'm pleased to report now that I think uh, the board meeting yesterday, around about 70% of those errors have already been dealt with by clinics. Uh, which is great, and I'd like to commend clinics for doing that. Um, when we've finished that first tranche, we'll then release the second tranche, because what we don't want to do is just, you know, pile more work on clinics as, as we go through. But, but that work, uh, if we can progress under the, the plans we've got, then, you know, that starts to put us in a very good place then for working out when we can actually update, choose a fertility clinic, and we shall have um, sort of after Easter, early summer, we should have a clear view as to when that's possible. Because for, for the moment, what I don't want to do is sort of set a false deadline because much will depend on the progress we make over the next coming months. But uh, at, at present, on both of those er crucial area, er areas, 
we are on plan and on track. I will obviously keep AGEC uh, appraised of the detail and certainly uh, keep the board up to date, particularly if we show any signs of, uh, if you like, no longer being on track. But so far, so good. Great. I hope that's a helpful introduction. But happy to take questions on any of that or indeed anything else in the report before I hand over to uh, Claire. Any questions for Peter? Thank you. At least, well, that's encouraging, at least, yeah. isn't it? I think so. Uh, so now um, we'll hand over to Claire, who, who will cover uh, various items which she'll introduce. I'll just speak very briefly, just to reflect uh, back on the report that we published about ex-sperm and embryo donation towards the end of last year. Um, just to report back, I think, thanks to uh, the hard work of the intelligence team who wrote a fantastic and very detailed report, which was very timely, and to the hard work of our, everyone in our communications team, uh, we achieved over 600 pieces of coverage for that media coverage, including 20 national titles. And thank you to Zainab, who wrote an excellent comment piece citing that report as well. Um, stakeholders were very engaged in the report and uh, reposted lots of information on that, um, so it did very well on social media. And we were particularly grateful to a member of our patient engagement forum who wrote a personal blog um, about their experience with donation, which also was very helpful for us to have. Um, the key messages that we were covered by the media and social media coverage was the number of cho children born from donor conception since 1991, the change in use to about half of donors, particularly sperm donors, are overseas sperm donors, and the changes in rules to anonymity, which we know there's a great deal of media and social media interest, and more about that in the presentation later today. Um, Moving on, uh, our long-awaited consultation on changes to the HFE Act is planned to be launched at the end of next month. So as you know, we hope to launch that much earlier after the summer and in the autumn, but because of the widespread political turmoil, we've put that off. And now we're hoping to launch at the very end of February for a six-week consultation period. Um, again, look out for coverage of that, and we'll make sure that uh, you uh, know well in advance of that going out and have information to encourage anyone who's here or listening in to respond to that consultation so we can get a wide range of views. Um, I just wanted to point to, to two uh, upcoming things. The first is that uh, SCAC will meet on the 6th of February, I think it is, and that will be the first time that SCAC uh, review the add-ons on our, that we provide information on our website along to, on the new re uh, rating system. So look forward to hearing the outcome from that from Tim and colleagues, and then we will be publishing information for patients um, and clinics and anyone interested on the add-on system later in the spring to um, really... Uh, uh, show people the new five, uh, five category rating system that's moved on from the previous traffic light rating system. And the last thing I just wanted to mention was a rise, I think, uh, in MP interest in some of our areas. So um, there's long standing been MPs interest in the funding situation for constituents, uh, whether the nice cycle, number of cycles are being adhered to and that sort of thing. But more recently, there's been interest in um, employment rights, so fertility treatment being the right to time off for fertility treatment as an employment right. There's a private member's bill going through at that point. And there's also a new private member's bill entitled uh, Fertility and Transparency, which obviously is of great interest and reflects very much some of the work that we're trying to change in our Changing the Act work. Um, so we'll keep you abreast of some of those things. And it ties in very much also with the government's women's health strategy and our Minister Maria Caulfield has noted our work on add-ons and in other areas and there's been a welcome from ministers uh, on our consultation looking at changes to the law for the benefit of patients. So I think that's a, a changing situation in terms of interest from Parliament in our area. Thank you, Claire. Any questions for Claire? Comments? No? Okay, so let me hand over to Rachel. Thank you. Just a couple of updates. Firstly, on OTR, it continues to be a busy service. We always do see an increase in applications around December and in January, possibly media interest or DNA testing kits being bought for Christmas presents. So um, we have seen, we had 57 received in December and so far 43 in January. 
Um, closed in December, we closed 34, but that was due to the team being one member of staff short, but we now have changed the team structure and we are now at full complement with somebody being recently recruited. So hopefully that will bring us stability in the team to be able to now work through and close more per month. Um, just a note on licensing, licensing performance. Um, we do have quite straightforward inspections where we have good compliance, but we also have inspections where we do see varying degrees of levels of non-compliance which can add complexity to the post-inspection process and that might mean that we're asking for further information or it might mean that we have management reviews with myself or the chief inspector or our legal um, advisors and we can also ask for accountability meetings with PRs as well which obviously then takes time to do that so it does lengthen the time that those reports are either sent back to the PR or go to licensing so they will always be reports that don't meet the KPIs but that's part of the normal process and our our government you know making sure that we get the information we require from clinics um, we have a very busy inspection schedule coming up. We have booked all the inspections up to August. We're still catching up slightly from COVID, from some licences that were extended, and we are doing as and when we need to do extra inspections as well. So we've got a certainly a busy first half of the year coming up. And then just to finish, following on from Julia for Fertility 23, we were very well representative from, represented from the HFEA, various policy and intelligence colleagues, and the, it was great to meet so many people there, but there was also some excellent lectures there, many on AI and automation, sort of automation of ICSI. There was some talks around implications, counselling for donors and donors... Uh, people using donor gametes. I think one of the interesting lectures was also on the situation in Ireland where there isn't regulation and there was a, a very strong feeling from clinicians there to introduce legislation and interestingly a very successful survey was ran, ran among fertility patients and 99.7% of service users wanted some form of legislation there and I believe we've got a follow-up meeting in uh, next month with the Irish. Thank you. Any questions for Rachel? No? Uh, so lastly, uh, Richard. Uh, thank you. A very brief update from me, um, just adding a little bit more detail to the um, information in the papers provided. Um, at the end of period eight was reported, uh, we had a a material underspend um, in our financial position. Primarily, this was generated from income, and a lot of that is because we've reconciled a number of clinics over this financial year. So, as you'll recall, um, we, we were estimating bills for clinics that weren't providing data to us under the PRISM system, um, and what we've done over the, the first half of this year is reconcile those back, and we found, on average, 6% uh, um, variance between what we'd billed and what was actually reported to us. Um, this has led to a significant increase in our income over the budgeted position. Um, so we, we believe this is primarily because of um, the reconciliation. We don't think this is indicative of increased activity overall. And in fact, we don't think until we get to the last quarter of this year we'll have any real data um, we can actually provide um, to, to the, the authority in terms of where we think the income position actually is in reality. Um, otherwise, in terms of expenditure, we are slightly underspent. This is primarily dri driven uh, year to date by delaying some spend on some of the developments around the OTR project. Um, and also a significant number of staff vacancies which we continue to struggle with and that we've reported previously. That uh, obviously has an impact on our financial position and has uh, reduced our expenditure. Um, we anticipate being around five to £600,000 underspent at year end. Obviously when we reconcile the remaining nine clinics outstanding that figure may change uh, but we don't really think at this point that's going to be a significant change in that position by year end. Um, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Um, Graham. Less a question, more an observation, and that is that uh, if the year end is a five to six hundred thousand pound surplus that is returned to the department, that's a very significant proportion of our grant in aid, is it not? Uh, 
Uh, it won't be returned to the department. Um, we have a significant cash surplus which we continue to grow as a consequence of this. Um, Amy's smiling because she knows what's coming next. Um, we have an ongoing conversation with the department. We are, we are stuck by HM Treasury rules, which means that Petra's accounting officer can never spend more money than he generates in years. So when we have a, a, a surplus, it goes into our cash reserve and we can't ever get back to it because Peter's never allowed to spend more money, i.e. our surplus from year end. So we have a, a problem we're trying to resolve with the department. Um, I think it's very difficult to, to count the HMT rules. I think we are reaching a, a point now where um, we'll have to consider what we do with this surplus if we can't spend it. Um, there are significant pressures, I think, across the department and uh, publicly known departmental pressures on, on budgets. Um, we would like to access this surplus. Historically, authority members have been keen for us to try and use this money to invest. Um, and we would be keen to do so, but ultimately I think at the end of this financial year we're looking to reach a remedy with the department which is either a way of accessing that, those funds or to consider how we might return them in some way um, to, to stakeholders. That's, a very, that's something we have considered before, um, but it's not, this isn't money that goes directly to the department. If we, we pass the surplus on, it will be treated to effectively deemed to be a tax um, as opposed to our, our revenue, so um, we don't pass it back to the department. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, very difficult to uh, understand. We've had this discussion quite a lot, and the surplus <laughs> keeps growing. But at the moment, it's unresolvable. Hopefully, will be resolved at some stage. Um, right now, we come to considering the draft business plan. Um, as you will all know, we've had various discussions about the business plan. Uh, which we're required to set each year and we need to get uh, approved by the department. We, if you recall, did have a, an initial discussion in November and I think also I've, we've had various conversations with authority members and we've got a, a reasonable view of what members feel should be prioritised uh, for this year uh, and what should perhaps be deep prioritised. Um, given the resource constraints uh, we're under and constraints on public finances generally, I would say, um, you know, to the extent that we want to do things, it always means that something else can't be done, uh, which is very frustrating because there's a lot that we need to do um, and we won't be able to do all of it. But I think we've tried very hard to put together a draft which prioritises those things which should be at the top of the list, uh, while obviously not forgetting things that we might want, want to return to at a later time. So the paper uh, which you'll have seen um, in, in tab five, I think, uh, sets out exactly um, uh, where we are, and I think Paula circulated a note on, on priorities and trade-offs, you, you, you'll have seen. So I'm going to ask Paula to present the paper now, she's on screen, and then uh, we have to approve the draft, or at least the activities section of, of the draft uh, business plan for 23-24. So um, to start with, I'm going to hand over to Paula, and then we can have a discussion about it. Thanks, Julia. Yes, so thank you everybody for your replies when I circulated the revised proposal just before Christmas. So this activities section that is in the papers reflects that proposal and all of our earlier discussions, as Julia said. Of course, this will be the first time you've actually seen the main section of the business plan in full because our earlier discussions were centred around the priorities. But of course, the business plan needs to reflect all of our statutory work too. And I'm sure you've noticed as you look through it how big a proportion of our work and therefore our resources that really is in practice. So we have this fairly long list of non-negotiables, which is our statutory work, so inspection, licensing, information provision, managing the register, and things like continuing to embed PRISM and looking after our core IT systems and things like that. And we know that we may also need to address any changes that arise with the Northern Ireland Protocol or to the Tissues and Cells Directive. And similarly, whenever our public body review happens, we will need to support that. And we need to do work every year on the DSPT toolkit requirements and, and other stuff. So as I've said in the covering paper, we know that the first half of the business year will consist of some major resourcing priorities. So thinking particularly about the development work we're doing on the opening the register service, 
servicing our public body review when that happens and completing the work that we're doing on Act reform following on after the consultation. So after all that, we will then need to assess what else has happened, what resources are available, and think about then whether we can progress other actions, including the government's women's health strategy and the scoping work we want to do on transparency and regulation. And last but not least, I'm really looking forward to developing a new strategy with you this year. So that will be for April 2024 onwards. So we'll be working on that in the coming months too. So that's it really. This is for approval, please. And we will either bring you back the full business plan in March, or we might circulate it for comment between meetings. And that will depend on the timings with the department and their sign off relative to your meeting dates. So over to you for comments and questions. Thank you. So uh, you'll have seen the list and you'll have read the report. Any comments, questions? Is everybody... Uh, Alison. Thank you, and thank you very much, Paula. A very, very clear paper here. Just a quick question arising from the issue that Richard flagged on vacancies and allied to that staff sickness um, and the, the, the turnover issues. Uh, to what extent does that bring into threat the delivery of this work in the year ahead? Did you hear the question, Paula? Not properly, not fully. I heard that it was I heard the bit about staff sickness and turnover. Yes, so, so to what extent does that problem, that issue or challenge, um, raise risks with the delivery of this programme of work? Well, we thought about that when we were um, planning at CMG, the corporate management group, where we start to think about what's realistic. And we'll be giving that more thought when we look at Teams' individual service delivery plans in February and March. So I think we have to take it as it comes. As things are now, we believe that this is manageable. If things change, then we might have to come back to you. Thank you. Peter. Um, it's not something. Can you switch your one off? Um, just, just to add a bit more, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right, Ali. I mean, I mean, fundamentally, this assumes that we have the people we want uh, you know, in the right things, and if all that happens, we deliver stuff. Now, clearly, if uh, sickness or turnover, uh, you know, impacts on particular teams, that might make certain activities vulnerable. And um, inevitably, that it will sort of depend where they fall, because there are some activities in here which really do require, if you like, deep knowledge in order to make progress. And there are others where, uh, you know, more generalist, if you like, bodies on the ground can pick up the slack if we... So, you know, you're absolutely right. But I think, I think you know, to pick up Paula's point, uh, we've not really built in much slack here. We're trying to do the maximum with the resources we've got. If we came under sustained pressure, particularly in certain teams, that would call into question or at least delay some things. And I think Paul is right. We're just going to have to be sort of fairly agile with you and report as is. But what we've not done is sort of say, well, let's, let's assume, you know, we've permanently got 10% less resource. What can we achieve? Our working assumption is, you know, given the resource we've got, what can we securely do. If we keep that resource, we believe this is manageable. Uh, significant you know, losses to that resource, then we're going to have to have another look at that. Um, I, I've got... Well, it, it's, it's partly a question. Um, we don't yet know the timetable for the public bodies review, but if that were to be delayed a bit... Um, would, do we have a, you know, are we able to sort of look at something that we've deprioritised that we might be able to do relatively quickly to fill the space? I mean, in fact, with anything, if, if, if you know, do we have sort of understudies, if you like, uh, if, if things take less time or, or, or they don't happen in our, in our main body of activity? Shall I take that one, Paula? Yeah. Yeah, please I mean, on the, on the public bodies review, in, I mean, your general point is, is a good observation, Julia. On the public bodies review in particular, um, I, I think it's highly unlikely. And because, on the whole, most of the impact of the public bodies review is going to be felt on the senior team, um, and freeing up 
uh, you know, additional oversight or something doesn't all of a sudden make, uh, you know, a piece of work achievable. Um, and there's also a distinction as well between something that is, if you like, put back a bit and something which is cancelled. Yep. So until we're clear there. But I think of all the bits of work, actually, um, while um, the public bodies review may, in particular, as I say, uh, cause a lot of additional work to the senior team, I don't think that were it not to go ahead all of a sudden uh, we could bring something forward and make significant progress uh, on something that we're not, which I know is not the answer you're looking for. But I think that's the honest one on this. It's probably the answer I expect. <laughs> OK. Um, so does anybody else have any comments? I mean, I know that um, this has been discussed both in the authority and with individual members quite a lot. So I think we know this is... We, we've got to sort of where we're going to be on this and thank you Paula to you and your team it's a big piece of work and um, very well very well done so um, I think I have to ask authority members if they will approve uh, this section of the of the draft yeah. business plan yeah lots of nods around the table anybody with any concerns no okay Paula you've got your approval and you go ahead thanks very much thank you uh, right, well, we, we, are, we are cantering through. Uh, we are actually due to have a break, but I think given that press on, um, shall we? we should just press on, if that's everybody's fine, there's coffee outside for anybody who's not online. Um, right, um, so now uh, the RRP, the Register Research Panel, um, the annual report to the authority. So... Uh, the register is a very valuable research result, resource. We 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 um, we allow access to identifiable data for research projects, and the way that that data is accessed and whether it can be accessed um, is uh, overseen by our register research panel, and that is required to report once a year to the authority. And um, it's that time of year, so they're going to do that. Um, today we're going to review the work that they do and um, uh, there are some various arguments uh, in favour of statutory cha change to some of the statutory rules uh, that allow research to be undertaken in relation to specific projects and so on that we'd like to share with you and just um, see whether you are in agreement to having some of these uh, regulations uh, change somewhat. So firstly, I'm going to ask Amanda Evans to introduce the paper and explain to all of us what this is all about um, and then we can have a discussion uh, and then vote on whether we will approve any changes to the regulations. Amanda, all yours. I don't know why you have to press that it's, it's, it's on. Oh, okay. Um, uh, for, for slides, shall I just... Uh, De Paul Debbie, do you have us. control? Or Paula has control? Okay. Um, I guess I'll just tell just you... Just give what. me a shout when okay. you're ready for the next slide, Amanda. Okay, lovely. Um, so uh, the first uh, part of this presentation will be the standard uh, register research panel update to authority. Um, and then the second half of the presentation will look at um, an item that we have for you uh, around a decision to make. Uh, so next slide. <laughs> Um, so just for a bit of background for uh, those who aren't as familiar with the 2010 regulations, um, so uh, these uh, allow for the disclosure of information for specific research purposes, either medical or non-medical, and the authority has delegated that power to the Register Research Panel. Uh, the Register Research Panel will decide uh, to grant, refuse, or impose conditions on these Register Research Panel projects. Um, it's chaired by a director within the HFEA, and it also has membership from across the organization, particularly uh, those with uh, research backgrounds, um, those with an understanding of the data register, uh, clinical or policy expertise as well. Uh, since 2010, there have been 20 approved projects in total, so we're looking at one to two projects typically approved per year. Um, and currently, we have uh, 11 projects that have completed uh, the work that they propose doing, and we have nine that are currently active. Uh, next slide. <laughs> um, so uh, for a summary of the activity that was done throughout 2022, uh, the, the panel unfortunately was suspended from September 2021 to May 2022 
uh, that some of you may already know. Uh, this is due to delays with PRISM and difficulty for us to uh, get the data from the new register out to researchers, as well as um, uh, using the new system just generally. Um, the panel reviewed six amendment uh, requests during that um, suspension period. This is typically uh, project extensions, just ensuring that the projects can continue during this period. Uh, since the panel opened, uh, we had our first meeting in September. We've had two meetings in 2022 where we reviewed two projects. One was approved. Uh, we've also done a lot of process improvements during that suspension period. Um, so for example, we cleared backlogs that existed due to delays with PRISM. Uh, we also had uh, legal training for all members of the panel, and this was with our uh, new legal advisor who attends meetings to provide legal advice around the 2010 regulations where necessary, as well as data protection law. We've also developed new infrastructure that's built around PRISM, allowing us to provide uh, new register data out to researchers. Uh, we updated our decision tree uh, with help from this legal advisor as well. Um, and we've just launched this month a new data research webpage, giving more information to researchers about how they can access data, either anonymized data or through the register research panel. Uh, we've also updated, continued to update uh, documentation, especially following legal advice that we've received around the decision tree. Uh, for example, our application form for researchers. Um, in 2022, we also recruited a senior research manager, uh, which uh, is a role much more focused on managing the work of the Register Research Panel and data research generally across the organization. We'll be looking to uh, uh, promote research in the uh, next year as well, and this will be a key role for that. We've also recruited a data and insights analyst, which allows us to have a second analyst in the team, which of course is critical to ensure that the data is quality assured well and we can meet uh, timeframes laid out within the regulations. Um, s many researchers don't require um, uh, personal identifying information on patients in order to conduct their research. Most of them do use anonymized data. Um, so we provide data out publicly from the data register in a number of ways. Uh, of course, you'll know about uh, our data research publications. So we publish usually uh, annually uh, uh, a report called Fertility Trends, Fertility uh, Treatment Trends and Figures. The most recent one of these is 2019. This is due to delays with PRISM and data validation. Um, in the last year, we've published multiple reports, um, multiple births in fertility treatment, impact of COVID-19, which was published in uh, May of last year, and Trends in Egg, Sperm and Embryo Donation, which was published in November. We also publish anonymized uh, publicly available data sets, which is cycle level data, um, which is freely available for researchers to use on our website. Uh, the latest data for this available is 2017 to 2018, again, due to delays with PRISM as well. Uh, we also respond to data inquiries from the public. Um, this could be freedom of information requests, parliamentary questions, or queries uh, that come in through the press office. Um, work that we're looking to do into 2023, um, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of work over the last year improving our processes and documentation. What we'll be looking to do in the next year is to uh, start uh, engaging with researchers more, promoting uh, the use of data register more broadly. Um, so this will be, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we've uh, just launched the new data re research webpage. Uh, we'll be looking to ensure that it does consistently have the right information. Uh, that researchers are looking for. Uh, we'll also look to promote uh, the use more widely. Uh, this could take the form of webinars, mailing lists, or events with researchers as well. And we'll also be looking to, um, over this year, consult with researchers to look at the publicly available anonymized registered data set to see whether it is fit for purpose or whether changes should be made. Um, we will also continue our work on improving the processes uh, and support the work of the Register Research Panel. Uh, this will be uh, uh, particularly important that we look at how um, we quality assure data extracts to ensure that we're providing uh, high-level data out to researchers um, and we have a good quality assurance uh, process in place. And we will continue to review SOPs and documentation as necessary as well. Um, so this is the section for decision. Um, in June uh, of 2022, we met with eight researchers to discuss um, along the work that we've been doing around modernizing the act. We started looking at the regulations and where this could be modernized. The 2010 regulations now are almost 15 years old. 
and it's starting to show a bit of its um, age. <laughs> um, so I've put forward uh, four different areas that I think particularly are showing their age at this point that we would seek to do uh, a proposal to DHSC um, to update these regulations. Um, so the first one is cost recovery. Uh, some of you may know that currently the regulations only allow us to charge up to uh, 5,000 pounds for any research project. This is very low. <laughs> um, in discussions that we had with researchers in June, um, they said typically if they're looking at doing a data research project similar to what we typically do, uh, they'd be looking at at least 20,000 um, pounds. CPRD and NHS Digital are examples of cost recovery models that we could mimic. And we could start seeking um, to recover costs outside of just preparing the data set itself. There's a fair bit of administrative work in order to ensure that we're meeting the regulations and security arrangements in place at the, uh, at the organization that we're providing the data to is adequate, um, as well as preparing data processing agreements with any third parties involved with data linkages. Um, the next one is uh, currently the regulations prohibit us from using any data that identifies or relates to donors, um, which given the changes that we're seeing with the 2005 uh, donor anonymity removal is starting to seem quite dated. <laughs> Um, currently, essentially what this means is no high quality uh, research is able to take place using personal data, um, particularly, uh, of course, for donors um, and any treatments using donors. So this is going to impact any studies on older patients, single patients, patients in female same-sex relationships, and any research on surrogacy arrangements outside of using just anonymized data. Um, so the next two are to do with consent. Um, so our regulations, um, currently what we've been doing is an opt-in system. Uh, this was the biggest area I think uh, researchers uh, brought up in our meeting with them in June was concerns about consent. Consent rate that we have in uh, recent years is the highest we've ever seen, but realistically it's still quite low. We're looking at 70 to 80% at best uh, in recent years. That means that researchers are missing about 20 to 30 percent of cycles. That's going to introduce a bias uh, in any research they're doing, and it's going to reduce the accuracy of their findings. So they were quite concerned about this. Um, and if you looked at opt-out systems, where patients, if they don't want to be involved in any research, they would contact NHS Digital, for example, and say that they didn't want their health records being used in the research. That tends to have a higher consent rate, above 95 percent. So. Uh, we, we would propose seeking um, the ability to swap to an opt-out system. And the last point I have to raise is um, consent for children conceived through assisted reproductive technologies. The regulations are quite clear that when children reach the age of 16, they would have to contact to opt in at that age, which is unlikely to happen. They would have to know that they were born through fertility treatment and know that they have to opt in for research. Even if some children do, or, or adults do reach out to us or their clinic, the numbers would be quite low. So essentially what this prohibits is any long-term follow-up studies on children born through assisted reproductive technologies. Um, this is only for children born October 2009 onwards, uh, but it does prohibit, for instance, egg freezing long-term follow-up studies from taking place. Um, so just to go to the last slide, um, uh, the authority is asked to note the annual report uh, from the first section on the register research panel work uh, and consider suggested proposals to reform of the 2010 regulations. Um, this would, um, uh, if the authority is convinced of the case for reform, we shall approach DHSC. Amanda, thank you very much. Uh, it's very clear and helpful. Uh, comments from anybody? Uh, Tim and then Alison. Um, excellent work. Um, on the, in terms of the, the, the publications from the approved list, I can see, I mean, there was five in the last year, so clearly I imagine it's sort of ramping up. But of the 19 papers um, that, have come, that have been published to date from the list, um, 16 of them are just from three groups, three research groups. So it's obviously a very limited number of people are actually using this data. So you touched on how are you going to try and increase awareness, because there's a lot of work going into helping th three groups at the moment. Is it on? No. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. We, we do tend to work with the same researchers and they do multiple projects. What we'd be seeking in the next year is to, to raise awareness that this data register exists. Uh, it, it's always disappointing to find out that people don't know that we hold a national register that is 30 years old <laughs> and like the, the amount of data that we hold on it as well. So I think um, getting that information out there is going to be important work that we start doing now that we have the processes in place that we can actually handle these applications quite well. Thank you very much, Amanda. Really interesting presentation. Um, my question is about uh, the one of the, well, a couple of the proposals that you've mentioned, um, where researchers could benefit from being able to have more identifiers about um, individuals contained within the data. Can you give us a bit more of a flavour of how identifiable um, you mean? Um, because to what extent do you consent issues start to arise or privacy issues start to arise? If uh, individuals are, you know, is it names and addresses? Is it is it more demographics? What, what exactly are you talking about? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, one one day I'll figure this out. Um, <laughs> It, it depends. Um, so researchers, uh, one of the parts of the administrative work that we have to do is researchers have to tell us why they need the data. If they have a, a really good reason for why they need, for example, we don't actually have addresses for patients, frustratingly, um, but if, for instance, we had that, they'd need to describe exactly why they needed that data, and they'd need to convince the panel of why. Um, they also go through research ethics committee approval as well. Um, but it's unlikely. Uh, usually the reasons that we use identifiers is simply to link to other data sets such as NHS Digital. So the identifiers would be used for that linkage, but then they wouldn't be provided to the researchers. They would get a, a pseudonymized form with the identifiers fully removed. Um, okay, but in terms of the proposal to potentially ask for the regulations to be changed to allow for more identifiers, would that be sort of potentially anything depending on the panel's approval of the data that is held? Okay. Um, so uh, in the proposed changes, it would be um, it, it wouldn't increase the amount of identifiers that go out. Um, it would allow us to have, I, I guess, is this around the donation one? Okay. Um, so that would, currently what we have to do for if a research project um, applies to us is we have to remove anything that relates to donation entirely. So research with donor insemination, um, donor eggs, donor sperm, it has to be fully removed. So it would just allow us to have um, more of the data that is already stored on the register to be used in projects. It wouldn't increase the identifiers, um, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, I, I, I had imagined that the, the panel was entirely reactive to proposals for projects, but your proposed changes, which, which I support, seem to suggest that you're identifying barriers to research that you want to remove and I'm just wondering whether this is leading to a rather different sort of panel which promotes research, um, given the small number of, um, relatively small number of projects. I wonder whether that is a change. If, if so, I would welcome it, but I, I'd just like a bit of a reflection on that because it seems, you know, it, it, it is a, it's a rather different sort of panel if it promotes potential research, which we may need. Um, so the, the proposed change for uh, promoting research wouldn't be the panel. I guess uh, I, I should have been a bit more specific. It would be us and the executive. So the research and intelligence team has a few members of staff who um, put together the papers, work with researchers um, to get their applications in and provide the data out to them. So we're separate from the panel, and we would be the ones who would uh, be organizing potentially webinars, mailing lists uh, to further engage with researchers. So it would be separate, um, but, but it would be new for our team to do for sure. But we'd feed into what the panel has to do. Yeah, yeah. It, it could increase their workload. <laughs> Can I just respond yeah. on that point? Just to pick that up, Graham, 
So I suppose the distinction is what we're not suggesting that we're not suggesting that the panel's decision is uh, influenced, if you like, by the fact that we think research is a good thing. We do want to see more research. Tim is right. It's very concentrated. We think this is a very valuable resource. We want to encourage active research in that area. The panel's job is then to, uh, you know, look at the application within the terms that are allowed legally and make a decision. And it seems to me it's entirely possible to be enthusiastic about research more generally as an organisation and still make sure that the decision is solely within the terms that we're allowed to do it. So what we're not doing, what we're not proposing to do is somehow sort of wait the decision because we like research, therefore we'll go easy on the decision. The decision is the decision against the test we're required to do. But as an organisation, strategically, we think this is an underused asset and we'd like to encourage more people. So does that yeah. allow us to sort of do the two things at the same time? Say that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. That's really, really interesting. Um, in terms of the four areas of modernisation of data research legislation that you were talking about, it occurs to me that some of those, particularly the child consent, can also relate to our statutory obligations to inform patients of, you know, safe safety of treatments because if uh, if legislation like that precludes long-term follow-up of fast-growing treatments then um, you know we're, we're not able to comment on the safety and efficacy of treatments so you know I understand that it, that that child consent clause must be there to protect children but in in trying to do that um, you're also creating, you know, potentially much bigger risks. So I'd be very much in, you know, favour of those discussions opening. Um, I'd be really interested to hear a little bit more about, um, you said when research applications are made, you could refuse them or accept them or impose conditions. What kind of conditions are within your remit to impose? Um, so I, I guess it would be... Um up to the panel to decide. <laughs> um, so uh, the, when the panel meets, what they could say is uh, potentially they think that the data is too identifiable for their research purposes. That tends to be one of the things that comes up. Um, so it would be that the panel requests that they either remove some fields uh, from their study because they think they're irrelevant um, or something like that. Um, I guess also how long the data could be stored. Um, it, its conditions uh, kind of that aren't within the regulations because the regulations are quite dated at this point and uh, aren't uh, terribly uh, helpful when it comes to the details. <laughs> um, so it would be kind of um, us as the panel uh, working with uh, modernizing and ensuring security arrangements are, are proper, which the regulations don't go in detail about. Um, just to come... Yeah, one of the things I was thinking is, of course, because from your perspective, from the um, research register panel, it can be quite a labour-intensive process to make data available to researchers. A, a kind of a, a, a category of um, sort of conditions that could also be possible would be about, you know, publications or reports because I guess hypothetically it's possible that you work very hard to make data available but then the researchers don't produce anything so you know those those could also be useful conditions and also maybe some kind of awareness raising of HFEA data that would go along with the publication of materials just to kind of really um, raise awareness that this data is available and kind of make it make it more of a um, talking point. Um, it, it is one of the things that we brought up in the panel, um, uh, publishing in open source uh, peer review journals. Uh, we have imposed conditions uh, previously where we've uh, told researchers that, that we wanted it to be uh, publicly available, their, their results as well. So that is something that the panel does tend to do as well. Thank you. Uh, Gita? Various people around the table. I'll get to everybody eventually. Gita? Uh, thank you. Um, Amanda, great work. Uh, thank you very much. There's a lot of information, and I have to applaud you and your team for the brilliant work you do and all the data that is there. Uh, is that working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was just congratulating Amanda and her team for the excellent work and also uh, the amount of data that is there, and I echo Tim's 
observations about um, only a few groups using this and how we should be raising awareness uh, to get more publications out of this excellent um, information and wealth of data that we have got. My question is more about uh, the process or our data points because the data points have changed on the anonymized register in the few in the last few years and some very important data about the age, the actual age, the actual number of eggs, they have really shifted to groups now. And I actually don't know when that happened and what advice was given because some of the papers, very good papers published, wouldn't have been published if the data had appeared in the current way. So are you able to give us some information as to who decides? And that applies to even ethnic disparities data because there's quite a bit that's restricted at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, so, so this is um, the, the publicly available anonymized data set. Um, we need to ensure when we release this, because it's in the public domain, that there is no chance that anyone could be identified from this data set. So it needs to be strictly controlled, banded. So where it's banded, it would be that it's a rare occurrence. <laughs> so it would be um, some, something that doesn't happen very often. So potentially someone could be identified by it. Um, I guess how strict we end up being with that banding is part of what I want to discuss with researchers. Um, it is, the, the issue with it is it's a cycle level data set that's quite large. <laughs> We're trying to give it more information. So I think what, what I want to do in future is to look at um, whether we should separate it out. So if people are mostly interested in what's happening with the eggs and embryos, maybe we could refine that a bit and be a bit more granular, for instance, with the, the patient's age and the number of eggs and have the exact ones in there. Um, but we'd have to, I guess, um, still consider those rare occurrences where maybe it's a bit higher and lower than expected. So we'd still need to suppress if it's outside of um, normal, I guess, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Jason. Thank you. Um, yeah, taking into account the fact that it's three main groups that are, that are doing this kind of research and we want to encourage this kind of research um, and understanding that we do need to recover costs and it's very expensive to, to, to get the data to them. Uh, it, it does seem that raising the price from 5000 to 20000 uh, will discourage at the same time that we're trying to encourage. And I'm, I'm not against that, but it, it's just a, a comment that I would make. I don't know how we, how we square that circle. Claire, do you want to? Just to say, we can't unilaterally change the price. So at the moment, the regulation set out a maximum of £5,000. So it's only if the government, or the department, decides to change the regulations. The feedback we've had is that it's, so, it's almost... I wouldn't say putting people off, but it's almost laughable how low it is compared to what research groups are used to. So, and I don't think it would be, you know, right, let's overnight if we had the okay from the regulations changing to increase to, you know, from five to 20. I think we'd be trying to work through a cost recovery because as Amanda says, you know, the amount of time to sort of process and get the data together. I would never want us as a public body to, for people to be penalised by the cost of accessing. So I think we would always have the opportunity to kind of open discussions with people if that was a barrier to application. But just on the three research groups, I mean, we have a similar conversation when we talk about scientific research <coughs> or kind of, you know, RCTs. This is an area, uh, I think all of us would like there to be many more research groups applying. Um, but it does this, you know, there's a small group of people, particularly in the UK, and one of the restrictions in the regulations is that you have to have a link, either be UK based or have a link with a UK institution to even apply to the panel. So the regulations are very, very uh, restrictive at the moment. Claire. Uh, sorry, Jonathan. Oh, um, could, could I just step in on, on Jason's question as well? Um, the the £20,000, sorry, I, I should have been more clear. Um, I, I don't want a blanket cost for this. Um, I would want to work on a cost recovery model, which um, for, for some projects it can be quite simple. If they're looking at a pseudonymized data set that just goes from us to the research establishment, those would be much cheaper because they're much easier for us to deal with. But let's say they're linking with three extra data sets where we need to work with the third parties involved, get data processing agreements. That is labor intensive. Uh, so those I would expect to be on the, the higher range. Um, it would just simply allow us to recover costs. And 
I should also mention that these uh, costs are covered by research grants. Uh, they're, they're not an issue. When we speak with researchers early on, they'll talk to us two or three years before they plan on applying, asking how much should we put in the grant. Right now, the 5,000 pounds, we, we actually have a weird situation where the researchers will ask to put in more, <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to give us more money through the grant, uh, which does really show that it's, it's not a problem for researchers. And in our discussion with them, they were very clear it, it's not an issue, and it might actually uh, increase uh, the level of applications that we do eventually get through the register research panel. And I should also say, we do have the publicly available data set as well, which tends to be sufficient uh, for a lot of research purposes. Yes, thank you also for a great report. I, I had a, a, a concern about the moving to the opt-out. Um, and. I think it's generally thought that opt-out systems are only really justifiable if people are clearly given the information so that they know. And so I wanted to hear a bit more about how you're going to make sure people know that it's an opt-out system. Uh, and in particular, people who have given data uh, in the past when it was an opt-in system and perhaps deliberately decided not to opt-in, how we're going to make sure they're aware of uh, the change. Um, so for, for the last part of that question, if um, for the period where we have asked consent, I don't know how that would function, but I would imagine that we have to respect consent provided for previous years, uh, so we wouldn't be able to change anything for the 2009 to current period. Um, it would be going forward that we'd swap to that. I think um, that would probably involve the comms team <laughs> a, a fair bit, so using um, our website, social media, um, I think it would also be quite good... Um, to potentially look at NHS Digital, um, particularly if we were considering changing um, the consent for children um, once they reach the age of 16. People may not know that they were born through fertility treatment, so if they're opting out from NHS Digital, potentially seeing if they could post um, information that we have an opt-out system as well that they'd have to apply to. Just on the issue of consent, and um, in Amanda, in your presentation, you mentioned 30% of the data can't be used because the consent isn't there. There was an interesting presentation at Fertility 23, um, and it would be interesting the clinical colleagues to get your opinion on this, was that when a clinic had switched to electronic consent, they'd had a significant decrease in the amount of patients that were consenting to use in training. It went something like from 80% to 50% of the patients. And then it was quite reassuring with the new HFEA consent forms because there was more explanation in that. When they started to be used, the number of patients consenting actually went up slightly, but it was nowhere near the same amount as when an, an in-person consent appointment was done. So I just wondered whether you thought the online consent platforms would have further impact. Oh. oh, thank you. Oh, I'm still not. There we go. Um, so I think possibly, yes. Yeah, uh, my experience is that our, our nurses are incredibly good at <coughs> describing and discussing these issues with patients and, and encouraging patients. Um, although, um, you know, not all patients will, will sign up. I, I, I think that makes a big difference. And I think an electronic consent system can't make up for that personal touch you, know, you can't ask it a, a question in the same way you would a nurse and so uh, it's a big worry because we're, we're transferring to electronic consents and uh, my concern is that we will see a drop I haven't experienced it yet uh, Francis is on this point just wait then I'm just going to sorry Claire did you have anything to add before okay so Gudrun and then Francis Sorry. Yeah, you're on. You're on. Yeah, you're on. Red light. Um, two things. One, to try and encourage maybe international use of the data, which I think is restricted. Could there be an international based UK hub that would do work from within the UK but would include international collaborators as part of a grant application? Um, I'm sure you could work with grant bodies such as Wellbeing of Women Charity and other charities that like to do reproductive fertility-related research to 
maybe asked them to have a call of this sort of nature that was directed at using data from within the HFEA. Um, that takes a little bit of work walking around charities and talking to them about usefulness. That would give you a bigger international pull. Um, and it would be exciting for UK workers to work internationally with the data sets. And they could include data sets from other countries. And my second thought was with the pricing, um, I know there's a restriction on the 5,000, but maybe this is trying to be too clever, but could you say 5,000 for a certain set of data? So if someone comes to you and asks for three different sets of data, that will be three lots of 5,000 rather than a blanket 5,000 for a massive amount of data which requires two or three of you working several weeks to put together interfacing with other organisations to get the data sets or just almost the same as they could get online anonymously. Um, I assume the anonymous online data isn't five grand. So you see that's free. So you've got a very strange system here, I think. Um, I would be tempted to do a I don't know whether I'm looking at Peter, whether that's allowed, but um as for it being costly and researchers finding it not particularly costly, um, from my experience of running a biobank, £5,000 for data is cheap, um, particularly if they're going to get publications in fertility and sterility that helps them get their next four or five million pound grant application and possibly promotion of themselves up the academic tree, which are the two things people most look for. Um, so I think five grand is cheap. But I think I've said this before, um, possibly three years ago. Thank you. Um, for the, uh, so you're, you're entirely correct with the, the UK restriction. Um, that, that is one of the areas in the regulations uh, that's also uh, a bit frustrating as well. We do get some interest from international research groups. I don't know, so what we tend to say to the researchers who reach out to us from international um, areas is we, we just tell them to get a UK collaborator. Um, that, that tends to work quite effectively. Um, I imagine potentially that was the reason it was put in there was to ensure that a lot of the research could be still held within the UK. Um, and would benefit UK researchers. So that tends not to be as prohibitive as uh, it, it sounds, uh, but exploring a UK hub uh, is quite interesting. So it, it is something I'd be uh, up for looking into. Um, with the 5,000 for each data set, I, I think um, we could potentially apply that when um, projects come back for amendments. So if they're looking for like updated data or to have additional fields added in, we, we've already told them uh, that those could be chargeable, um, and I'd understand charging um, for the amount of time it takes to update those. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think th those are the only circumstances that we could charge a, a second time with that. In an ideal world, we would love to know what happens to children born following fertility treatments, not just around the time of birth, but throughout childhood and even into their adult life. Um, but I also recognise that it's important for families to be allowed to decide what they tell those children, and there will inevitably be some children who were born following IVF who are never aware of that fact. Um, now, it's a few years since I've had to make this sort of grant application, but there used to be a system, a, a, a legal system, whereby you could apply for exemption from the requirement to obtain consent if the best way of collecting the data was to um, do so without requiring that consent. It was called obtaining a Section 251 exemption from the National Information Governance Board. And I wonder whether that's something that might be worth considering. You may well have done so already, so that you would actually continue to link long-term health outcome data to presumably the NHS numbers of children born following fertility treatment, but with that data always being held behind a completely secure firewall so that there was no risk of it being inadvertently disclosed, because that would enable you both to collect the data that everyone would find very helpful without compromising the privacy of the families involved? Um, so, yes, uh, so the Section 251 is not applicable with our regulations, unfortunately. We did get legal advice on this. Um, so um, 
we because we get an opt-in system, uh, we have to use the consent uh, that is provided to us. We can't uh, function on the Section 251, uh, unfortunately. Um, yeah, uh, if we do swap to an opt-out system, um, potentially it could be applicable, but I'd have to explore that with a legal advisor. Um, if we were to swap to an opt-out um, system, potentially that would be applicable. Um, but as of right now, what I understand from the legal advice is we require explicit consent. Um, yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, really great presentation. Obviously, fully support that we, we take all four to the uh, Department of Health. Um, and, and I think certainly on the, on the cost, cost recovery, you, you know, as you've shown with benchmarks, we, we're, we're under other kind of practice where it's probably similar researchers are bidding for other data like CPRD and are, and are baking that in. Um, m might be worth as well. Some of Gudrun's points are, uh, are, are probably a longer term piece of work around the database architecture and how people are accessing the data. So if we had a federated system where there was one instance of the data but researchers are drawing, are then going into that and taking what they need for their research, it moves some of the data governance queries and that, that would kind of might, you know, kind of best practices, it doesn't matter where, you are, where you're doing the research around the world, but the data would never leave the, the secure environment of the HFEA, as it were, and you would then take out the results. So, and that, that probably should reduce the cost as well in terms of the linkage and such. So that's probably just a more long-term project with, I, with IT colleagues that I think would reduce the barriers of entry, which is where everyone's going. Um, uh, for uh, having, uh, I guess one of the things that we're exploring right now is kind of the direction of travel uh, of uh, having research data sets, especially following linkage, available to researchers outside of that original project team as well, which is something that's quite complicated from us on an IT side of things, but it's something that organizations like ONS, SRS are already <coughs> doing. Uh, so we're exploring options to have them hold data sets following the linkage study where researchers would still apply to us, but be able to access them. So making that data set have a longer life as well. I think just to follow up on the general discussion, I think although the numbers of peer-reviewed academic journal articles using our have, that have gone through the register, register research panel over the last few years is low. We've never had the capacity until now to deal with a high number of applications because we haven't had the resources either because of PRISM or with the, in the intelligence team. We do now, although I think as Rachel and I and others in this room sit on the register research panel, it's become, uh, I think the word is fiendishly complicated. Uh, the decision about whether this is a kind of a project that's in the public interest and would help either people, researchers or the general public look at um, outcomes following assisted reproductive technology is fairly simple for us based on the applications. What's very complicated is whether we are allowed to release that data because not only of our regulations, which are quite out of date and complicated, but of other things like data protection and where the data is being held. If it's in a cloud, you know, we're being asked to consider whether a cloud that is owned by a company in Arizona is as secure as a cloud owned by a company in Whitechapel, you know. I don't know is the answer. So it's becoming, um, w our intention is to make it more available and simple. And we feel very constrained by the current st situation, which is not only because of our regulations, but of wider con concerns over both IT and data protection. I think that 2023 is a bit of a um, cliff edge for us, and we'll see what happens over this calendar year. And it may be that we come to you in a year's time and say, actually, the register research panel as is perhaps isn't you know, sustainable longer term. You, you sit on committees, you sit on the license committee and the statutory approvals committee. You don't sit on the executive licensing panel. That's a staff, uh, staff led committee. And it may be that at some point the register research panel is not appropriate and we take it back to authority. But I think 2023 is the sort of test ground. And the other thing I wanted to say in terms of use of our data so Anne Harrod, who's here, and Lauren, who is outside the room, and I speak to journalists daily, and I can't think of any conversation I have that we don't talk about our data. And I mentioned previously the 615 pieces of coverage, including 20 pieces of national coverage of our donation report, and each one of those used a piece of our data that came from our register that Amanda's team kind of analysed and made it in publicly available. 
So although the number of formal applications to the Register Research Panel has bubbled under being fairly low, the use of our data daily in the media and social media, I think, is um, unprecedented. So I think we shouldn't be sort of too disappointed on the one hand, because on the other hand, we see um, the widespread use of our data all the time. So I have a couple of observations. Firstly, I'm delighted, you know, we're, we're, we're forging ahead with the use of our data uh, I agree with Claire, we're already using it. But in terms of research projects, I think as we go forward and maybe making, you know, if we agree to go to the department with some of these changes, you know, over time we will get more applications uh, for, for really good research projects, actually, which will be it's something that we've been talking about for ages and it's really good that it's beginning to, to develop. Um, just a thought, um, you know, uh, particularly in the legal profession, and I know a little bit about this because this is what I was involved in in sort of pre previous life uh, it feels like there are some really good examples of data hosting and processing um, particularly from the legal profession actually uh, with e-discovery and so on where, where there's, there are really sophisticated ways of, of actually processing the data, of hosting it to make it easier to retrieve and cheap and so on. And if you want to, I suggest we have maybe a, a chat offline because um, I, I think you know that there are ways of getting reviews of this to see where what 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 tech there is that that can help us as as our data sets grow. Um, maybe Alex also uh, would be would, would be involved in that, so we can talk about that. So any other comments on this that was a great discussion thank you but what we are being asked to do is to approve um, Amanda and the team to go to the department with the four suggested changes um, to the regulations these are outside the HFE Act uh, um, the 2010 regulations so is everybody in favour lots of nods around the table anybody with any concerns or against no. OK, Amanda, thank you very much. You have your approval, and uh, please keep us posted uh, as to what's going on. I'm sure Amy's taking notes. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Um, right, uh, I think we'll crack on, actually, if everybody is happy. Uh, now, um, we've talked a great deal about uh, OTR opening the register which is we're now in 2023 so we are months away uh, not not years away um, uh, at in November we talked about provision of some of the support services including counselling um, I think now what we're going to do given that we are months away is um, uh, step back uh, looking at the ramifications of OTR, the remo removal of anonymity, uh, and uh, really the, the sort of that aspect and, and other aspects of how this is just really going to affect us. It's probably one of the most important things that we're going to be involved in this year. Uh, and so Rachel and Claire are just going to really give us an overview and set the scene for the work that's going to be done for the months ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to start off with a presentation and then Claire's going to carry on later on. So as Julia said, this is um, a very much a focus of the executive at the moment. Whilst we do release identifying information for donors that have re-registered, obviously from October when the first children are born from being conceived after the 1st of April 2005, potentially we'll have an increase in the number of applicants and the dynamics of it will be slightly different because of course the one donors that have re-registered are actively seeking to want to be identifiable to donor conceived individuals. So the presentation just goes through looking at a bit of the background which we have presented on this, as Julia said, in November, so you, you are aware of the background to the changes in law in 2005. But just to summarise the challenges for those affected by donor conception, such as the donors, the donor-conceived individuals, those working in clinics, and the HFEA itself. Claire's then going to take those challenges and look at the work streams and projects that we've got underway that are hopefully there to mitigate some of those risks. 
So firstly, um, just as the background, as we know that the law changed in 2005, which means that donor-conceived children can access identifying information, and that includes the full name, date of birth and the last known postal address. And it's important to note that it does actually specify postal address. As Anne Harrod and the comms team know, we do have a lot of interest around donor stories and we do anticipate a, a huge surge in interest, which I believe we've had already actually in the media and social media as well regarding this. So if we start to think about the individuals affected by um, donor conception, of course the donors are at the heart of that. And donors who donated in 2005, obviously that's 18 years ago, and time moves on and circumstances move on since then. And of course, with donors, we don't know the quality of the counselling and implications counselling, particularly that they were given in 2005. And... They may be in different family dynamics now, which means that having to reveal that they were a donor may be particularly challenging for them. We also want to be able to manage the expectations of donors and the donor-conceived individuals because it may be that the donor doesn't want to have contact with a donor-conceived individual. So the donor-conceived individual might have very different expectations to what the donor is prepared to, to allow. So the donor-conceived individual, um, firstly they need to know whether they were donor-conceived and then they will make a decision when they know their donor is identifiable to what information they would like to receive. We do a two-stage process where non-identifiable information is given to start with and then support is offered before they move to receiving identifiable information. And of course, a donor-conceived individual may never decide to contact the donor, even having that identifiable information. So there's a lot of um, work that we need to do and support and information for donor-conceived individuals. Challenges for clinics. This is new territory for clinics. Um, we have processes that are defined in OTR, which can involve contacting clinics to check details. That may have resource implications for clinics because there may be an increased demand from our OTR team asking them to check postal addresses. And there also might be general inquiries from donor, donor-conceived individual and patients um, for information, but also maybe counselling as well. And we need to also, in, as at the HFEA, we're looking at the implications of release of identifying information and how identity, identifying information can be checked. And clinics need to do some work around that themselves to ensure that they are working within the, the remits of the law. So this ties into all the challenges for the HFEA. We need to make sure that we're preparing to help meet those expectations of those involved. We need to make sure that our OTR service is working effectively and efficiently and we can get information out to them that is both accurate and in a timely manner. We also need to provide information to organisations, professional bodies and clinics to make sure that signposting to our service and other information is there for them as well. But also that's a broader remit as well to look at the, the wider world expectations of this and um, how we can manage that. And of course, as we know with the business case, this is a priority, but we do need to balance this work with other or the work that we've got. So I'll hand over to Claire now just to summarise where we are with the projects. Thanks, Rachel. So um, we're trying to look at this as a holistic priority for the HFBA during this year and beyond, uh, given the importance for donor-conceived individuals and their families, for donors, uh, for clinic staff, and the widespread interest in this area. Um, the three work streams that we are focusing our energies are the first and um, obviously crucial is the service that we provide, ensuring we have both the staffing levels and the correct uh, systems in place for processing the applications. And I'll say a bit more about each of these in a, mi in a minute. The future of the support service following the authority decision in November 2022. 
um, and a wide uh, range of communications activity. Um, I don't necessarily mean kind of a series of tweets, but every time we're talking at the moment, we're talking about the impact of opening the register and the changes in the rules from 2005, the change in the law, that is um, impacting people from this autumn going forwards. So in terms of the work for the service in particular, so this is a, a new IT system to make sure we have a, a modern IT system that's effective for managing applications. We've um, redesigned the staffing model to ensure that we have some resilience in there. Um, to manage the current demand um, and potential future demand. And we've also spent a lot of time managing policies and getting legal advice on a variety of questions that have come up or we are likely to come up uh, frequently as that service increases. And obviously, as we always say, the fundamental point of this service is getting the right information in a timely manner. And uh, we'd prefer that took longer and was correct. The risk of giving out incorrect information, and you can imagine, is, um, well, we're managing the risk. But the danger of giving out incorrect information is something that we would want to avoid at all costs. In terms of the future of the support service, I won't say too much about this because we had a more detailed discussion in November, but you gave us the... Um, uh, the uh, task to go forward to develop what was then called a multi-layered of support service. We're looking at what's done um, abroad. There are some really interesting examples of how this is opening, uh, working in other countries. And we're looking at what sort of funding model uh, we can A, legally propose and B, more practically propose uh, to come to you later in the, in the year, in this year, to look for um, approval of a model or a different type of model. We're working very closely with key stakeholders in this area to ensure um, that should they want it, donors and donor-conceived individuals can access specialist counselling and increasingly peer support, which is something that certainly the Donor Conception Network feel is one of the most important things that those uh, children who are turning 18 later in the year and beyond will be looking for. And lastly, uh, we're having a, a whole work stream dedicated to all different types of communications activities. That's not only the information on our website, but a series of information points for clinics and clinic staff, um, engaging with the media, both mainstream media and uh, social media, raising awareness for those who donated in the past, who may have forgotten, they may have moved, they may want to talk to their families about donation and what might be happening, and obviously a high degree of key stakeholder engagement with our patient and professional groups, with the licensed centre panel and with clinic staff. I think what we really wanted to get uh, your views and thoughts on are the risks of uh, going forward and how we might be able to mitigate some but possibly not all of them so as Rachel said um, donor conceived individuals and donors themselves are going to have expectations of what may or may not happen and what relationships they may or may not have with each other our role in that is uh, well it's zero really but um, any uh, positive outcome from information released through our OTR service I'm sure will you know get praise and that will be very nice for our team but, I, you know, inevitably there might be some less favourable outcomes or people who are very disappointed or just hasn't worked out the way they hoped for. And that may come back to us as well. Um, clinics have, you know, a really busy and tough job as it is. And, you know, dealing with the day-to-day -day storage changes and other things. Um, and now they've got to think about those donors who uh, they worked with 18 years ago and what happens. And they may have donors and donor-conceived individuals coming back to the clinic as, and, you know, signposting to us for more information. Um, as well as donor-conceived individuals who may not have the relationship they may wish for, there is very strict requirements or allowances in the law about who can have access to the information. So, for example, if a donor has shared with the family that they donated, any children they may have of their own can't access the information from our register, so they might want to find out uh, you know, if there are genetically related siblings and they have no access rights, um, etc. So we may end up disappointing quite a lot of people as well. 
Um, so we've said the reputation risk is high both for those elements we're responsible for and those we aren't. So we can't be responsible for the relationships people develop or what they do with the information that we've given them. But ultimately, we're probably going to be uh, kind of... Um, uh, suggested that it's we're to blame ultimately for whichever those elements we are either responsible for or not. We've looked at what the resource demand may be and in the November authority when we talked about the future of support services I think we had a, a table or a chart where it looked at the number of potential applicants per year but again we have no idea from that number how many people know that they're donor conceived, um, how many people are waiting until they turn 18 to apply to us for information, or how many people may do it at some point later in their life. So it's quite hard for us to predict how to meet the resource requirement. And obviously we'll have to complete, have to go back and look at that in years to come, depending on what the uh, level of applications are like. Um, the law is complicated, well, I was going to say it's complicated and straightforward, and that doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's this very uh, restricted, so I think Rachel referred to the last known postal address. So, you know, for example, a donor may have got in touch with the, their clinic and said, you know, here's my up-to-date email address. Can you use that to correspond with me rather than by post? And that might be fine for the clinic. We, we can't do that if we have a postal address. Whatever the last known postal address we have on the register, even if it's addressed from 16, 17 and a half years ago, that's the one we have to use, which is obviously limiting and could end up disappointing people because people move, etc. Um, we don't know what access to information and support either donors or donor-conceived individual have. Um, you know, the, the view from many in the, who are specialists in this area suggests that peer support is one of the things that people are most like. They want to meet other people like them, so other donor-conceived individuals. They want to talk to them about how they've prepared to access this information and what they've done once they've got the information. But others may need specialist support, and there's a limited amount of that available. And lastly, as I said, there's a limit of what information we can provide. So we can only provide the information that we have on the register. So, you know, if someone has moved to you know, Australia and we only have the address when they lived in, you know, Stratford 18 years ago, then that's the only information we can provide. So I think that's about all I would say about the summary um, and just highlight that we are doing as much as we can to mitigate all those things through the work streams that we've talked about. We've got lots of internal updates, both through our project assurance group that Richard chairs, through our corporate management group and through the senior management team. We'll be coming back to the authority at regular intervals, both to um, provide you with information for a decision later in the year about the future of a multi-layered support service, but also with any updates that um, are relevant at the time. And we'll also be engaging, as I said, uh, frequently uh, with the relevant external stakeholders and with clinics. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Francis. Thank you very much. Quick question. I don't know whether you have um, donors' NHS numbers, but are you in a position to check whether or not they're still alive before responding to an inquiry? Because it might be easier for that information to be given to an applicant by the HFEA rather than them turning up on the doorstep of a, a grieving family, for example. I can try and... I, I think that um, at the moment we understand that we, that we as the HFE are not allowed to access NHS records. Um, that's the kind of current position as we know it. Yeah, we, we, are, we are seeking further legal advice on this, but initial thoughts are that we wouldn't have a lawful basis to necessarily go into the NHS records. And it's, a, you know, it's around the consent that the donors gave at the first time. Um, because there's also about tracing donors for their addresses we can't just go and use a passport or an NHS number to find out an address because that's not what it says in the legislation it's the last known post address that's on the register which we can check for a clinic we can contact the clinic and ask for an updated address because obviously there's the information exchange between the register and the clinic anyway but it's very hard for us to access NHS records as we understand it at the moment.
think the um, the care and thorough preparation that's gone into this is very impressive, mm. and uh, thank you for all that you've done, especially outlining uh, outlining all the all the risks that are there. I, I think it, it's going to be at its most delicate and difficult in these first two or three years mm. until you know, in a sense, what what are going to be the main problems, and obviously some of them are. Um, um, predictable, aren't they, uh, in that things have moved on in the last 18 years. I don't think postal addresses would be put into legislation now, <laughs> but we are stuck with what where we are. Mm -hmm. I think the, the thing that strikes me is that although the HFEA may get caught in the crosshairs of people's understandable unhappiness sometimes, we ought not to forget in all of this, as we list all the risks, that there are going to be a lot of wonderful stories of donors and donors conceived individuals whose lives will be enhanced wonderfully by this legislation and its and the way in which it works out and i'm sure in terms of our own communications we need to gather that information and be as positive as possible about it because as well as all the difficulties there's going to be an enormous amount of joy in this and one of our problems, I think, is that here we are looking at what are all the difficulties for the HFEA. We'll forget, if we're not careful, and regulators always think of problems, that actually there is going to be a liberation for all sorts of people in this. Uh, and we oughtn't to forget the joy. That's all I think I wanted to say, really. Um, that's a very nice reminder for all of us, Graeme. Thank you. I was actually going to say, in a sort of a similar vein, that... Um, there is some social science research that's been undertaken by Petra Nordqvist and um, Leah Gilman and their team up in Manchester with donors. And their research findings actually show that a lot of donors who donated after the change in legislation are actually very much open to contact. So, you know, uh, research findings that are perhaps m more optimistic and open than um, people might intuit. So that's also very encouraging. Um, in terms of potential risks, I think one potential risk in this area is that the narrative around the opening of the register um, could very easily be hijacked by exceptional individual stories. And I think it's very difficult for us as the HFEA to think about how we might mitigate that, you know, especially when the media and social media love kind of, you know, the more extreme cases. But I think it would be... You know, it's that it's worth thinking about because it would be such a shame if the narrative of opening the register in the UK got kind of taken over by by, by a couple of cases or a couple of individuals or whatever. Um, so that would be one area to think about. But thank you so much. I think it's really exciting times ahead. I was going to bring it back to the problems. I'm afraid. Obviously, no. Um, I, I think again, thanks for the work, and I've, I've been involved in some of the IT side. But I think it's just worth calling out in the risks around, which I know a lot of work's going into around the cyber security. So you know, as as inbound digital inquiries come go up, coming into the HFEA, so will nefarious emails and nefarious in, inquiries. And it, so it's just you know really important we we keep. The up to date on cyber. I mentioned earlier we, we discussed in the AGC around simulated phishing, but but presumably a bit like Freedom of Information Act, these requests could come in via you know routes we don't want them to come in, but we would then need to log them in the register and and, and so on. And so that's when you know people can suddenly send five members of staff a, a, a phishing email. So really, I just think for you know uh, completeness, we should call that out in the risks. Thank you. That's a very good point, and I think you're you're right. There's a there's a real um, there's a real potential for um, that sort of behaviour. And but if we're warned, we'll do. We, you know, we we can only do what we can do. But hopefully, there will be sufficient um, checks and balances in in place to recognise that. Um, anybody else? Can no, I... uh, Peter. Can I pick up on Graham's point? Because I agree entirely, and yet somehow or other we've got to sort of put that to one side, in the sense that, um, you know, our role here is actually, although it's really important, it's also really narrow. So our job is to provide people with accurate information we hold in a timely way. 
and to signpost them to support and so on. But if people don't choose to, A, take up the support, that's for them. And if subsequently, when they've got this information, the joy they hope for doesn't pan out because human relationships are pretty complicated, um, you know, that's a real shame. But again, you know, saying that's right, that can be part of the kind of reputational management of all this, but that's not our job either. We can't be responsible for the quality of the relationships that a donor-conceived individual may or may not make with their half-siblings or their donor. Uh, you know, it may be wonderful, it may be disastrous, or any points in between, but that's, that's out of our control. And I think there's a sort of sense in which... I mean, your points about the narrative are right, Zainab, but we, what we need to do is our bit of the job as well as we can and kind of hope that the rest just takes care of itself because what we can't be responsible for is how the rest works out. Well, except that we'll, we could easily become a scapegoat I agree. for people's unhappiness and no, that's not to do with the things... We can do everything brilliantly, but that doesn't mean I, we won't be subject to public criticism. And I'd like us to take some public praise yeah. for the things yeah. that we may not be responsible no, for. No, that, that's true. That's the bit of my thing I didn't quite say. You're absolutely right, Graham. I think that, yeah. that's absolutely right. You know, regulators always get it in the neck, and we just need to be ready for that. But we also need to be accepting of the fact that actually what happens out in the big wide world when people have got this information is really for them. I think um, I was going to make a very similar comment actually to, to, to Graham that you know the one of the issues and and it is sort of there in the risk factors uh, Rachel also alluded to it is regardless of you know uh, whose responsibility it is and it's probably not ours if a relationship goes wrong that you can just see the headlines yeah. Uh, yeah. which will hold us to account yeah. uh, wrongly Absolutely. for it so I think what we are trying to do and I know that you know Claire and her team, are really working on this is you know create a narrative over the next few months about what we're doing so to try to get as much information out there as possible so people understand the different roles um, and also you know consider what comms and communications we need going forward as we get closer to the time uh, which will which will help us contain that narrative I think um, so it's really hard, and we're never going to do it perfectly. But I think, I think you know, we'll do what we can. Um, I, I suspect there will be, there will be, you know, there will be as soon as there's a, you know, there'll be a couple of good news stories, and then the press will just want to see where it all goes wrong because that's sort of probably what they're more interested in. Uh, I think what we'll make sure, and we'll make sure also authority members have, is you know, proper talking points so that everybody is very clear what our role is, what our responsibilities are, and you know, we can sort of respond. Doesn't solve the issue, but it makes it uh, as good as it can be. Claire, I, I just, yeah, what do you think? I just wanted to add as mine if it's sort of quite a technical point, but it's come up quite a lot internally. So we sort of say as shorthand, um, anyone born from a donation from April 2005, but we need to be quite careful because it's actually anyone born from a donor post, po who donated post April 2005. And I know Amanda's team are looking at the numbers, but actually it's not really a majority of those donor-conceived individuals for another at least year to 18 months post-April 2005. So actually of those children born from donation from April 2005 onwards, it will be quite a small amount of people who can actually access the information because they are born from donors pre the law change, if that makes sense. So it's just a slight kind of... Um, uh, twist in how we talk openly or publicly um, about this because uh, the numbers are far fewer than those born from donor conception from 2005 onwards. I hope that made yeah. some sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, yeah, this is this is a problem that that sort of will start in a few months and ramp up, and it might not it might not even become a very large issue for another 18 months, two, three years. We, we just have no idea. But I think the, 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 the important point to note is that we're doing everything this year and now before it becomes an issue so that we're in the best possible position to give the proper information, the right information, and be able to respond to questions that we inevitably will be asked 
parcel of everybody, really. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I, you know, you'll all, we'll all be hearing a lot more about OTR over the next few months, but I think it's really important. And uh, Claire and Rachel, I think uh, these updates are very, very useful. And, uh, you know, I, I, honestly, I think every authority meeting now, even if it's only an update to say there's nothing to say, I'd like it on the agenda because I think, I think we, we need to, you know, walk with you step by step on this. Okay, so any other comments on ATR or are we okay for now? Okay, well, um, we're, we're, we're finishing a bit early. Um, that's not to say um, that we haven't actually covered some really important things today. Uh, I think the business of the authority will be ramping up and up and up to come to the board over the next few months. As quite, we already talked about some of the additional um, training and, and talking about strategy and so on. Uh, so thank you all for coming and just ask if there's any other business. I'm just going to go round the room. No? And even I don't have any today, <laughs> unusually. So have a great rest of the afternoon and look forward to seeing everybody soon. Thank you.